Tip number one. If you ever wondered how to put a gradient on a border and you don't want to go the extra mile with pseudo elements in CSS, then you can now use the border image property to put any gradient or image on that border. It will not work right away since the slicing of the border image will project the gradient only on the corners of the element. But if we set this to one by simply adding the value one behind the gradient, it will give us exactly what we want. You can control the thickness of the border using the border width property. And very interestingly, you can enable and disable the gradient for the edges separately by providing four values, each representing one edge. Tip number two, don't use grid and don't use flexbox for everything. I recently fell in love with this masonry type of layout or whatever you call it. Here, the elements are sorted by columns and they can have a varying height, which makes it perfect for an image gallery where you have to handle different aspect ratios. This layout is not using grid or flexbox, but it is responsive, can resize the elements and adjust the amount of columns that fit automatically. And imagine how excited I was to find out that all of this is possible with one line of code. Shout out to this channel who taught me that. I'm talking about the columns property. It has amazing browser support since it has been around since the early days of CSS, even before Grid or Flexbox existed. To achieve this layout, add a bunch of images to your layout container and specify their width attribute to be whatever size you want. The height will adjust automatically. I also recommend using images that have a varying height to make it look cooler. In CSS, all you have to do is to address your layout container and use the columns property. The first value says how many columns you want. I say three. And then the minimum size they should assume, 300 pixels. And that should already give us the desired layout, which is great. But there are a few optional things to improve. The distance between the images is very inconsistent. To control that, use the column gap property. That will control the gaps between the columns. The vertical gaps, however, do not follow the row gap property as I initially assumed. After experimenting for a while, I remembered that images are inline level elements, which means they are bound to the line height, like any normal text. And that messes things up. So simply change their display to block and use a margin bottom for the vertical gaps. And that should already give us the desired layout. Tip number three contains two properties I want to show you. They can level up the design of any form element by a lot. The accent color property is used to change the highlighted color of any form element. The color inside a checkbox or radio button, the progress bar or range selector, all of these have a blue color by default and you can control that using the accent color. And even the outline that appears on focus will be affected by that. To improve this even further, use the caret color property to change the color of the cursor that is blinking inside the text input. Tip number four, use the insert property. Kevin Powell has made a lot of videos about that, but here's the short version. On an element that uses position absolute, you can use the insert property as a shorthand for top, right, left, and bottom. And as you probably already know, that controls the distance between the element to the edge of the viewport. If you use position relative on a parent or ancestor element, then you can position your element relative to that element. If your child element has no height and width, then a value of zero will cover the parent element entirely. Applying four different values controls the distance to each edge separately, one value for every edge. But here's the interesting part. If you do have a height and width on the child element, then you can use inset zero and margin auto to center the element with just these two lines of code. Normally, an absolute positioned element needs some weird transform translate values to center it properly. But using inset zero and margin auto, your code will look a lot cleaner. Tip number five. If you have worked with dynamic content that is coming from a database, then you are probably familiar with the overflow property. We normally hide overflowing text using overflow hidden, or we make the container scrollable with overflow scroll. But both of these values are not quite perfect. Obviously, hidden is bad because things are not visible. But the value scroll will create these ugly scroll bars on every container, even on those that don't even need the scroll bars. So there are two things we can improve here. The first thing would be to specify the scroll axis. We only need an overflow Y of scroll. That will make the horizontal scroll bars disappear. Overflow X would be the other way around. The second improvement would be to use auto instead of scroll. That way it can detect automatically if we need a scroll bar or not. Only the containers that have overflowing text will get a scroll bar. Tip number six, shadows. You probably already use box shadow and text shadow to cast shadows on your elements. But these two properties will not help you out when you have to work with images, icons, or any other weirdly shaped transparent object. Here, a box shadow will cast the shadow on the box of the element and not on the real edges of the icon. To fix that, use the filter property and call the drop shadow function. Here you provide the same values as you would for a normal shadow. And that way it will cast the shadow around the actual edges of the icon. Tip number seven, how to animate to height auto. In case you didn't know, using the details tag and then a summary inside, you can create these collapsible HTML elements that we call accordion. 
Here we can expand the content on click. But the problem we face here is that we cannot apply a transition to that. If we want to open this smoothly, we would need to create a custom dropdown in JavaScript. Here, when the open class is applied, we want to set the height to auto, which is an automatic value that makes sure the entire content has enough space. In the collapsed version, we have a fixed height. Using simple JavaScript code, that will open and close the element perfectly. But here, we run into the next problem. We still cannot apply a transition to that. It won't work. Because for some reason, we cannot animate to height auto in CSS. If we would have a fixed height here, then it does work. But that is dirty CSS code, since we never know how much content we actually have in the future. There are two ways how we can fix that. The first one is an experimental feature, where we use a function called calc size and pass the value auto. This will work in exactly 0.02% of browsers, which is horrible. So instead, use a simple trick that involves CSS grid. You basically only need two rows. The first one is for the summary, which is the visible part. Apply a fixed value of 1.5 em, for example. The second row is for the hidden content. Its value is going to be zero fractions tall. Make sure the hidden div gets an overflow of hidden. That way, the zero fractions will make the div disappear, because now it has no size and all the text content is overflowing, which we can hide with overflow hidden. Now, when the open class is applied, which we do with JavaScript, we set the second row to one fraction, which is the same as an automatic size. And that will make the opening mechanism work with a transition. Tip number eight, use clip path for more creative images. This property allows you to create a clipping region that defines what area of an element should be shown and what not. It's basically a mask that hides everything outside of that region. You can create many different shapes, and since the logic behind that is very complex, I recommend using an online generator. Here I can simply copy a clip path I like. So if I want to use a triangle, I can simply copy the clip path from here and paste it into my CSS selector. And now the image has the shape of a triangle. Fun fact, we can do the same thing on checkboxes too. Let's apply a circle shape to get round checkboxes. Combine that with the accent color I showed you earlier, and we already got ourselves a nice design without having to create a complex custom checkbox. Tip number nine, how to create dynamic pseudo elements. We know that we can use the pseudo elements before and after to create nice designs and hover effects. And sometimes we actually use the content property to insert text. But doing it like this is kind of a one-time use. If we want to have many elements that use the same logic, then they all display the same text. And if we don't want to manually overwrite the content for every element over and over again, I recommend using the attribute function. Here we access a data-label, for example. Then in HTML, we can define that data-label attribute. That way, the HTML attribute defines the tooltip and we don't have to repeat ourselves in the CSS code. In the info card, you can find a video where I explain that concept in more detail by creating this social media button animation. Tip number 10, use conic gradients for better animations. Whenever you have some kind of rotating animation, like a design fragment going around the edge of an element, or just a simple loading spinner, conic gradients are what you need. The colors you define inside the conic gradient function go clockwise, which also means that the first and last color will have a very sharp transition. To fix that, simply repeat the first color at the end. You can control the angle of the gradient using the first parameter. Now you can go a step further and use a custom property here and then override that custom property using a keyframes animation. Here we simply override the angle value. And to make all of that work properly, you would need to use the add property rule. And if you're wondering what all of this code is doing, it just rotates the gradient. Yeah, that's pretty much it. If all of this seems a bit crazy and you didn't understand everything, then that's no problem. It was only meant to show you how you can use conic gradients in a completely unexpected way to achieve something like a rotating border animation. If you want to learn more about that trick, explained in a more detailed way, then watch the entire video on border animations here. My name is Fabian and this was Coding2Go. I will see you in the next video.